Our agency is deeply rooted in values like transparency, curiosity, collaboration, and human first. You are at the very interesting intersection of brands and creators. How do you balance the needs of both? Yes, I love this question. It's not always easy to be the in between. The balance is really finding this line between advocating for your creator and pushing back on the brands when necessary. Also, making sure that the brand is happy too at the end of the day. What exciting projects are you working on? Modern Speak, let's say service. We are launching a influencer marketing subscription service for hotels and restaurants so that they can pay into a program that will allow them to have consistent influencers. Any recent campaigns you can think which you're proud of, you really like the content. One of the projects that I worked on recently that I was really excited about was partnership between a smartphone company and a destination. This was an interactive YouTube series where we had five different YouTube creators go to a town in California that just elevated what the brand was able to put out for the launch of their product. Wonderful. There's times where brands will go to a creator and say, here's a brief, you have to follow it step by step. And then that content doesn't perform well because we lost our authenticity. Yeah, creative control is a very big piece of the puzzle. Hello everyone, my name is Shivam Tiwari. I'm the head of content marketing and social set fellow, the universal API for creator data. And I welcome you all to another exciting episode of Impulse, Google's number one rated podcast on influencer marketing. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Kristen Snell, a two-time founder and CEO, leading both Modern Speak, a digital PR agency, and Digito Inc., a B2B SaaS project management platform that houses all campaign data and automates the administrative side of the campaigns. Managers can focus on revenue generation for their creators. She's been redefining digital marketing and B2B SaaS while advocating for women in business. And we're excited to dive deeper into her unique insights on the future of influencer marketing and where technology meets creativity. Kristen, welcome to Impulse. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Let's start on a fun note. If you could pick a superpower in the world of influencer marketing, what would it be? So I don't know if this is necessarily a superpower, but from a business perspective, I would say instant payment. I oh. think one of the biggest challenges that most agencies and creators are facing is cash flow. I think we might be one of the only industries where we have to do all of our work up front and then wait months to be paid for the campaign. So I think if there was a way to wave a magic wand and reduce the net terms from, you know, I've seen up to 120 days uh, down to like five or 15, just so that creators could get paid a little bit quicker after finishing their work than having to wait, you know, months to, to be able to see that paycheck. Um, right. And then from a non-business perspective, and maybe more from like an ethical perspective, I just wish that there was more honesty and transparency when it came to having conversations around what a campaign looks like. I think that if everybody sort of came to the table with a little bit more, you know, just kind of open dialogue around what uh, the expectations were with budget and rates and just some of the challenges that maybe they were facing with their client or they were facing with us. And we could kind of just like pull away that veil a little bit and just have like a real conversation. I think so much would get done faster and it would get done in a way that I think everybody would just feel a little bit more comfortable with. So those would be my two. What do you think such a new industry operates in a very, you know, let's say Hollywoodish way when it comes to payments? Why influencers have to wait for, let's say, 120 days? That's Amazing. I mean, how can they do it? Why, why do you think that happens? I mean, I don't, I don't know for sure the reasons. I, I would guess that maybe a lot of the big PR agencies and brands that we are working with in influencer marketing haven't quite adapted their terms or their model to meet sort of this new industry. I think we are still living very much in the Wild West, as we all kind of say that like influencer marketing you know, it's been around now for a while, but it, it evolves at such a speed that, you know, it's hard to compare it to anything else in the way that it has moved so quickly. And I think for, you know, these really big agencies to be able to pivot and move their terms to meet sort of the needs of what these creators have as fast as it all is evolving is, is really tricky for them to be able to do. And so I think a lot of times too, it's like, you're dealing with a brand who has to pay the agency and then the agency has to pay the talent agency and then the talent agency pays the creator. So a lot of times if creators are working directly with a smaller brand, I think that there's a lot more nimbleness around how those terms look than when you have to kind of go through this like layered system of from the top down. Right. What's the first word that comes to your mind when we think of modern speak? I'd say communication. So the namesake modern speak came from the concept of the modern way of speaking. And so for me, like I always wanted the name to evolve with 
the public relations landscape and now with influencer marketing. And I knew that, you know, as an agency, we always wanted to adapt with how brands and creators were speaking to their audiences. And so as a business owner who works with people all day, I also like really value open and clear communication. And so it just, it's in the name, it's, it's in the way that we do our business every day. It's we're, we're talking and speaking and, and making sure that we're communicating in a way that just makes everybody feel seen and heard. Wonderful. I love the name Modern Speak, by the way. It reminds me of one of my recent favorite TV series, Modern Love. If oh, you have amazing. Seen. I love that show. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So good. Nice. Which app? On your phone, do you use the most? I think if it's non-work related, I would say if it's work related, probably Instagram and Gmail, (laughs) but non-work related, Spotify. Music is my happy place and I love finding new artists and songs and making playlists for people. It's a love language. So I'm, I'm on that app a lot. Nice. So you are big on music or podcast on Spotify? So much, much more music. One of my goals for myself this year was to try and listen to more podcasts, but I find that every time I'm like walking or in the car or something, I just immediately gravitate towards music. I think, you know, being a business owner, I'm, I'm learning all day long, every day. I'm reading things. And so sometimes it's nice to just be able to tune out and listen to music, but I definitely am always open for podcast suggestions so that I can get a little bit more into that. We'll ask you for your suggestions at the end of this interview. But for now, (laughs) let's start with Modern Speak. Please tell us the story behind it, what inspired you and how have you evolved over the years? Absolutely. So my whole life, I always knew that I wanted to be in a field that allowed me to connect with people. So I got into public relations and moved into tourism and hospitality. So previous to starting the agency, I worked for destination marketing organizations and were promoting visitation to you know the places that I lived. And in that job, I was working with a lot of YouTube and Instagram creators to be able to tell their audiences about the destination and all the things that you can do here and why they should visit. And I got a bit of a crash course in working with their agents. And so in those interactions, I was learning in my day job, just how they were advocating for their creators, how they were negotiating deals and all of that stuff. And I found it really fascinating that that was a career and a job. And so I've always been very entrepreneurial myself. And while I was working for a company, I always had a bit of a side hustle. And at the time, my side hustle was letter boards, which was those like wood frame felt line message boards. A lot of parenting influencers were using them to, you know, show the milestones of their babies to like into kindergarten and all that kind of stuff. And I was trying to kind of break into the US market with the letter boards. And I reached out to a bunch of parenting creators and asked them if they would promote my letter boards. And they all said yes. And none of them asked me for anything in return. And I thought it was the strangest thing. I was like, why did all of these strangers just do me a huge favor and ask for nothing in return? So afterwards, I I reached out to all of them and, and asked them that. And their response was, well, we're working with some of the biggest brands in the world and they're not paying us. So why would you? And I was like, okay. Wow. Okay. I don't think that's how this should be going. So I sort of offered to walk them through their next few partnerships so that they could, you know, figure out how to properly price their channels, how to advocate for themselves, how to have that kind of conversation. Modern Speak, the letterboard company transitioned into an influencer management agency basically overnight. Because as soon as I started helping them, they were like, you can never leave us. And then they started telling their friends and I was able to leave my day job and start Modern Speak in 2018 through word of mouth, which I feel very grateful to this day. A lot of the creators that we work with have all been through recommendations and referrals. Right. So if I summarize the value of Modern Speak, it's about people, communication, clarity, honesty, things like that you stand for. So my question is, how do you stay true to those values as you grow and, you know, work with different kinds of creators now uh, different of different categories. So how do you maintain that core values? Yeah. So, I mean, our agency is deeply rooted in values. Like our values are transparency, curiosity, collaboration, and human first. And so everything we do is informed by these words. And we are transparent and honest about budgets and challenges. We get curious and ask questions rather than making assumptions. And we're collaborative with our creators, our clients, and our brands. We're working so that we can always find women solutions. And at the end of the day, like we're all humans <laughs> with complex lives. And, you know, we want to honor that and and make sure that everybody feels like they are being treated with respect and that we understand that at the end of the day, we're not saving lives. We're working in a, in a fun industry that is meant to be creative and to get 
you know, stories and narratives out there for brands, but it's important to also acknowledge that sometimes people have bad days and sometimes there's lots going on in the news and there's things where I think just deep down, it's important to remember this world around us is, is there's so much more going on than brand partnerships and things like that. So we feel so aligned in those words that if anything ever feels misaligned, we get, first of all, we get really curious about it and start asking questions. And if we can't find sort of a way to kind of grow out of that challenge, then we just, we make decisions to whether it's end a relationship or move away from a certain brand, whatever that might be. We, we make those decisions pretty quickly because we just don't want to feel like we're aligning with things that just don't feel good at the end of the day. Right. And when it comes to platforms and working with creators, you work with predominantly short form creators or long form from YouTube or what what sort of platforms do you cover? All of them, at least the, you know, the major ones. We, in terms of like niches, we are working with a lot of videographers and photographers. So we do a lot of tech related brand partnerships. And then we also work in the travel space and parenting and then pets. We have a few pets on our roster as well. So it's a nice balance between all, you know, all kinds of different brands. But I would say our, our bread and butter really is this kind of convergence of tech and travel and how they work together, which is something that I'm really excited and passionate about. That's an interesting mix. And speaking of pets, are these pets on roster like, you know, there, there were pets given credit in Hollywood as well. If, you know, a chimpanzee is in the film, the name appears. Is yeah. that the kind of deal you're talking about? So none of the creator, none of the pets that we work with are Hollywood stars yet. Um, <laughs> yeah. But the channels are of the pets, although the owners are very much involved in the channel as well. So it's a mix between lifestyle and yeah, pet care and travel. Those ones are, are really fun because they kind of cross a lot of different verticals. And just to be clear, when you say tech, do you mean B2B influencers? Or no, B2C? we work, it's it's more B2C. So the, t the types of brands that we're working with would be camera companies, smartphone companies, monitors, editing software, music Got subscription it. companies, things like that. Yeah. Got it. Tech products, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Nice. You are at the very, you know, interesting intersection of brands and creators. So how do you balance the needs of both? Yes, I love this question. It's not always easy to be the in-between. I will say our role as like a talent manager and agent is to advocate for the best interests of our clients, which in this case happen to be the creators. So we are that buffer between the brand and the creator to keep everything on track and, you know, keep everything going. But we also sort of are in this position where we need to advocate for our creator as well. So sometimes that looks like having hard conversations with brands and pushing back a little bit and making sure that, you know, the agreement or the, you know, statement of work that we agreed upon isn't kind of getting a scope creep or that we're like kind of moving outside of what sort of the agreed upon terms were. But I think that the balance is really finding this line between advocating for your creator and pushing back on the brands when necessary, but also making sure that the brand is happy too at the end of the day and that they're getting what they need out of the partnership too. And I think walking this line is, is a very fine one, but it takes a lot of creative problem solving. Like I think about any of the campaigns that I've worked on in the last few years where I'm kind of hearing from one side what their needs are. And I'm also hearing from the other side what their needs are. And so now it's my job to get really creative in terms of like, how do I make sure that both people at the end of the day get what they want and feel like they're being heard. So I think a really big part of my job is translating creator speak into brand friendly speak and brand speak into creator friendly speak. Sometimes, you know, brand feedback can come in and it can be a bit you know, blunt or a bit, you know, kind of just like, this is how it is. And so working with people who are creative, it's like taking that feedback and then sort of making sure that it's coming a little bit softer by the time it lands in front of the person who has just created, because at the end of the day, this is their art and they are putting it out there. And it can be vulnerable to say like, here's what I created. What do you think? And then have someone be like, boom, 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 boom with critiques. And so it's sort of like the sandwich effect. It's like, let's come with something really positive and then sneak in a little bit of some criticism and then end on something positive too. So I'm really mindful of like, in my role, how do I do that? And also just make sure that I'm keeping the project on time, on budget and all of that type of stuff as well. And so I think another thing that kind of comes back to the communication piece too, that's really big for me is that if we are, you know, in a place where, Maybe there is, I don't want to say conflict necessarily, but like maybe there's some things happening where it's feeling like maybe there's some friction. I'd rather just hop on a phone call, kind of chat through what the you know challenges are so that we can right. address them rather than getting into like an email or a text 
conversation where you can lose tone and things like that. It's just so much easier to just hop on a call so you're not misinterpreting any information. But I think we all have the same goal in this and it's to produce successful content and to have a partnership where we can continue to work and grow together. So that's right. the, all of those things are kind of all coming together when we are working. I'm glad that you, you know, use this word successful content. Any recent campaigns you can think of, which you're proud of, you really like the content. You can even name the creator if you want. And why, why did it, you know, stand out to you? For sure. So earlier I said that like one of the things I'm the most passionate about is this uh, intersection between tech and travel. Uh, Having come from a tourism background, one of our challenges was that we didn't always have the biggest budgets to be able to afford to work with the creators that we really wanted to work with. And so we were able to offer flights and accommodations and experiences and food and all of that kind of stuff was within our scope. But oftentimes the budget wasn't. And so one of the projects that I worked on recently that I was really excited about was a partnership between a smartphone company and a destination. And so the smartphone company had the budget to put forward the fees for the creators. But then we sort of got stuck in this place of like, well, where are we going to shoot this? How are we going to make it exciting? How are we going to make it engaging? And there was no budget beyond the creator fees to build out that excitement level to build out anything more. So we were like, well, what, what do you need? You need a place, you need a cool and exciting place to shoot and a cool, exciting place to shoot needs a budget for creators. So how do we bring this together and and find a strategic partnership where both brands feel like they win. And so this particular campaign was a interactive YouTube series where we had five different YouTube creators go to a town in California And they did helicopters and vintage cars along the highway or along the ocean highway and all of these really incredible experiences that just elevated what the brand was able to put out for the launch of their product. And I just loved the way that like that was really like A plus B equals C, like everybody got to kind of come to the table in a way that they could afford in a way that they could justify. And they all got to get so much out of it because they worked together. Wonderful. Sounds so, so much fun, you know, just to think about it. So, and this mix again, so interesting tech plus travel, because there's nothing more exciting. I mean, there are other things that are exciting, but <laughs> tech gadgets are becoming so cool. And of course, travel in the age of AI, it's everything. It's, it's a very good mix. Speaking of data, uh, social data is growing big. A lot more platforms are coming into the coverage. Even Philo recently launched LinkedIn uh, Creator Search. We are really excited about that. Uh, shameless plug. <laughs> uh, Amazing. Congratulations. Uh, his- <laughs> Thank you so much. How has Modern Speak leveraged social data to enhance the effectiveness of influence marketing campaigns? Yeah. So the thing for us is that we are primarily on the creator side. So we're not running the campaigns as much as we are putting the creators towards the campaigns. And so this is actually one of the things that I wish, again, there was a little bit more kind of transparency around is that we get to see the results of our, you know, creators campaign, because we have the insights and the analytics that we send over to the brand. But what we're missing is what was the ROI for that particular campaign? What were you looking to achieve? Was it an engagement percentage? Was it a view number? Was it, you know, a certain amount of sales? Like, we aren't privy to the information of what the success metrics are for that campaign. And so we can pull the analytics of a campaign and send them over to the client, but we don't really know whether or not it performed well because we're not sure what they're measuring. So I would say in terms of how we are analyzing data is more in the sense of when we're bringing creators onto our roster, what are we looking for and what are those pieces? And so for us, one of the things that we're seeing a lot more from brands right now is is this percentage of US-based audience. And so, yeah, a lot of a lot of the brands that we work with are North American brands. And so from the U.S. perspective, a lot of these brands are looking for 70 percent, 80 percent U.S. audience from creators to bring them onto their campaigns. So we are looking for that sort of high percentage concentrated audience in one area, specifically the U.S. if possible, because that is kind of the 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 center for brand partnerships. Yep. We're looking at, of course, authentic following. What percentage of your you know, your audience is truly people that are engaging with the content, what are those engagement rates? And then multi-platform is really important for us too, especially now with short form video and the ability to have that same kind of video be, you know, shared across multiple platforms, YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. We look for that to have that sort of 
breadth of, of platforms. Right. But yeah, that's a really big thing. And I think, you know, one of the things also is so many brands will come to us with, with a campaign and they'll say, here's a creative brief. You know, we, we hired you because we love what you do and we want you to take this and make it your own. And in those right. cases, I would say it always feels like the content performed quite well. But then there's times where brands will go to a creator and say, here's a brief, you have to follow it step by step by step. And there is, it sort of loses its ability to be creative and it loses its yep. ability to appeal to that audience and have that trust between the creator and the audience, because now we've basically built something that isn't going to resonate with those people because they're like, this isn't, you know, the creator that I'm used to watching. What is this? And then yep. that content doesn't perform well. And then you kind of send the insights back to the brand and they're like, well, this didn't do well. And you're like, well, yeah, it didn't do well because we lost our authenticity and we lost the ability to tell the story in the way that, you know, we knew it would perform. So I think that when it comes to social data, I really hope that that becomes part of the conversation is the importance of creators creating what works for their audience. Obviously, they have to have the key messaging, they have to be able to incorporate the call to action or whatever it is that's going to make sure that the brand gets what they need out of it. But it's so important for the creator to use their voice and use their platform in the way that they know is going to work. And so I think that's where too the difference comes down to like, is this a social promotion? Or is this UGC content? Because if right. it's UGC content, then yeah, 100% give someone a script and, and and let them, you know, go with it because it's just going to go on your channel. So that's, you know, that piece of like that trust with the audience isn't as much of yeah. a factor in the case. Yeah, creative control is a very big piece of the puzzle. If you are, if you give them enough freedom, because the creators are the, you know, you're, you're trying to work with them because they're creative. So that's the thing. I asked my earlier question because, you know, at Philo, we focus on work providing that kind of transparency that you're talking about, both for creators as well as brands. So how do you see, you know, data players like us playing a role for, you know, agencies like you in the influencer marketing space? Yeah, well, I think you just said it at the beginning there is that transparency and trust is so important. With having these API tools, you're able to pull that real life data right away without having to fiddle with screenshots or have the people who have taken, you know, a document and maybe fudge some numbers and then just kind of yeah. sent it over. And we don't actually get to see like, what is the real, you know, true data that we're, we're wanting to look at. So I think, you know, that's, you know, very effective in that sense. I would say that real time campaign optimiz optimization that, you know, platforms like yours are able to provide where if, you know, I think about the times where we're part of a campaign that has multiple creators on it and everybody's kind of going live, maybe at different times over the course of a month, being able to sort of see in real time what's working and what's not working and being able to kind of make those adjustments throughout the campaign rather than getting all the way to the end and looking back and realizing oh, there was all these things happening, but we didn't know right. until, you know, it's too late. So yeah. I think that that's going to be great just to be able to have that opportunity to tweak and kind of like revisit as things are happening. And then, you know, the thing that I really love is this idea of like matchmaking and being able to find the creators that are really well aligned to the brands. And yep. so I think with like AI and with, you know, things like this, being able to really get into the analytics of that creator's audience. I love psychographics even more than like the demographics and the geographics like being able to know truly like what makes somebody interested in you know what you know what hobbies they're interested in what travel destinations they're interested in, all of those pieces is so fascinating to me and so I think we're gonna we're gonna find ourselves in a place where brands are going to be able to connect with their ideal customer you know so much quicker and yep. so much easier through this type of social data wonderful last question on modern speak not exactly last second last uh <laughs> What exciting projects are you working on? What are you looking to add to Modern Speak, a new feature maybe, or new, uh, let's say, service? Can you talk about it? Yeah, actually, we're about to launch a new service offering tomorrow. Oh, so yeah. this is great timing. Because we work in the tourism and hospitality space a lot on, on, our, on our digital PR side, so this is a separate entity to the roster. We are launching a influencer marketing subscription service for hotels and restaurants so that they can pay into a program that will allow them to have consistent influencers come to their property or to their restaurant, as well as, you know, UGC content creators. One of the biggest challenges for a lot of small businesses is they're not able to keep up with the amount of content that they need for their social channels. So we, you know, where I live in Alberta, there's 
so many talented videographers and photographers and there's so many talented influencers. And so we're bringing all of those folks together and then we're bringing together the tourism and hospitality businesses and doing this exactly what I was just talking about as a matchmaking service. So we can find the creators who are really aligned to their aesthetic that can create the content that they need on that regular cadence so that they have for their social, for their paid ads, for their website, for all of their promotions, things like that. Um, And then in 2025, just really trying to build out these strategic partnerships between the tech brands that we work with and then the destinations that we work with as well. So I think there's so much winning in that space. Right. Since you are essentially a PR agency, one question just came to my mind. How do you how do you make sure that, you know, a creator is safe to work with? They don't, you know, spreading, let's say, a political agenda or hate speech or, you know, any kind of thing. So what is your mechanism of brand safety? Is it manual? You go through, you know, profile by profile, you know, post by post, or you use a tool or what's the mechanism there? Yeah. So when we're onboarding new creators, we do it manually. We have seen tools out there for when we're working on a campaign with a creator, the brand will sometimes ask for them to sign into their platform so that they can do an assessment. So I have seen both and we have used both. I think Personally, I love technology and I love what it can do for us. And it's it's able to, you know, obviously save us time because doing it manually is, is a very yep. time consuming process. So I would say that anytime there's a tool available, I would I would much rather use that. It's great. I mean, I can. Is that something your tool is yeah. offering right now? Yeah, I mean, I can see if my team is willing to, you know, talk to you regarding that. But yeah, I mean, great to hear that brand safety is something that you take seriously. Let's come to Digitote now. Another wonderful name because I love tote bags. I have so many of them, (laughs) especially, you know, with the screenshots of my favorite films. Let's talk about it. What sparked the idea behind the platform? How do you see technology like this shaping the future of influencer marketing? You can tell us more about that. Sounds good. Yeah. So Digitote is rooted in a bit of a personal story. The name stands for digital tote bag in case that wasn't obvious, (laughs) but you caught (laughs) up on the tote part. Um, So I lost my brother unexpectedly in 2019. And when I'm that sorry happened, to hear about that. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, when that happened, I, I almost lost my business because being an influencer manager is a very high touch job. And there's a lot of hand holding and there's a lot of micromanaging through the different pieces of a campaign. And when you think about most talent managers have multiple creators that they're managing and might even be managing multiple team members that have multiple creators that they're managing. So it isn't just as easy as one person in one campaign, there's multiple campaigns. So it's very complex. And if you're not fully focused on what's going on in front of you, it's easy to lose sight of certain pieces and a campaign can fall apart pretty quickly if you're not tracking each step really right. closely. And so when that happened, I I needed to focus more on my personal life, just given what was happening. And a lot of these pieces were falling apart naturally. So I vowed that when I got back to work, I was going to figure out a way to systemize and automate a campaign process in a way that people could step away for, you know, a life event, or even just to go away for the weekend to go away for the evening. I also remember that during this time, I would go out for dinner with friends or with my partner at the time or with my family. And I'd be like, hang on one sec. Oh, I got it. I just got to take this. I just got to answer this. And it's just like, it's one of those jobs that feels like you just can never really step away. And I think so much of that is because the control has always lived in the in the manager's world and it doesn't have to be that way. And I think we do take a percentage of the campaign as commission to be able to do this part of the job, not Digitote, as talent managers, that's, that's what we do, right? So I think there's this expectation that we are the ones that are on top of every piece and we should be, but there is room for creators, especially from a transparency perspective, for them to also be involved. So what Digitote does is it's a two-sided platform where a talent manager can put in every aspect of the campaign from, you know, who the brand is and what the product is to the exclusivity, to the usage, what the deliverables are, all the creative briefs, every single piece that you would ever need into one place so that creators know that they can go to that one spot and find everything. They don't have to look in their DMs or their texts or their email threads anymore and try and figure out where all the missing pieces are to bring it together. Everything is in their tote. So it's in your tote. And the other nice thing about it is that brands can also go in and they can put their feedback for the campaign in there right away. So then if I'm in a different time zone, I am not making a creator wait 10, 12 hours to be able to get that feedback because now I have to take it and give it to them. 
So right. it's just, it's, it's kind of lifting the veil a little bit. And the other really big reason why I wanted to create something like this is I had heard from a lot of creators on Clubhouse that they were getting taken advantage of and potentially even robbed from their talent managers because a lot of talent managers manage the whole business side of the campaigns. And so they're, you know, managing the contract, they're managing the billing and the invoicing and all that stuff. And so if I'm trusting that my manager is dealing with all of that stuff, I might not see the contract. I might not see the invoice that's going to the client. I might just get told this is your cut and this is what you're doing and sort of just be like, okay, good to know. But there's sort of this other side of it where, you know, that might not be the case. And so the thing with Digitoad is it allows you to see the invoice that goes to the client. It allows you to see your contract so you can refer back to it if you need to for, you know, the next campaign, that kind of thing. So a paper trail, it's that thing that we all need when we're like, I'm working with this agency again. I want to refer back to like what I did with them last time. So it's a bit of a historical record as well. But then the other side of it is there's like this whole world of influencers that aren't managed. They're self-managed and they are having a hard time keeping up on their campaigns too. So Digitote for them can act as a talent manager to a certain extent that can keep them on track with all of their campaign deliverables. And it automates things where it will create your invoice for you so that you don't have to do that as an extra manual step later on. It'll add your you know, campaign dates to your calendar so that you're not having to manually do that. So it really does work alongside you to keep all of these pieces on track so that you can really just walk away and focus entirely on your creative and not have to worry that something's going to fall through the cracks. Wow. I mean, Digitote sounds very important in today's time. As you said, you know, having a manager and having trust issues is a very big, you know, hurdle in creating content. And in footballing terms, I am a huge soccer fan. You know, all the, you know, the, the managers of the team hate, you know, these player agents. They they just want to bypass them any way possible. So, Digitote, are you trying to bring, you know, more transparency or clarity to that relation between an agent or a creator or you're bypassing, you know, that person entirely? I think that there's a few different ways that that it can be used. So for a self-managed creator, it does bypass having that agent. And I think to your point too, there is a lot of friction and challenges with brands having to work with that middle person to get to yep. the creator. And there are creators who who absolutely are so busy, they have to have it. And, it. and it is a role that's not going anywhere. So then for those brands, this is a tool that gives them access into the conversation so that they know where things are at. I think so oftentimes we are not able to give those live updates to that agency as quickly as we probably would like to. So right. if they were involved, then they would at least know where things are at and they would feel probably more secure in that campaign, knowing that we haven't dropped a ball or that things are happening and they are in progress. And then for creators who don't have a talent manager, whether they need one or not, I think this facilitates a lot of those administrative hours that they would be able to get back into their creative process too. So for those creators that that might be really large, like a self-managed creator doesn't necessarily mean that you're not, you know, at a scale where you could have one. Some, for some people, it's a personal preference where they prefer to keep, you know, that extra 20% of their money and they would prefer to know everything that's going on in their business and not have another person involved. So it doesn't, it's not based on like, you know, what size your account is or how much money you're making or anything like that. It's just, it's a tool that can work really well for agents like myself that want to have a little bit more work-life balance and be able to also be really transparent with my creator about, you know, I want you to see everything that's going on in your business because that's important to me. And then it's also could be really great for brands to be able to use it as a way to put out those campaigns to their creators for an opportunity. And then same for those self-managed creators. So we kind of have three different user types that can all benefit from it in, in, a, in a very unique way. Right. And to address this, you know, trust issue, sometimes people hire their own cousins or their friends as their managers or their, you know, agents. But of course, that's not a very scalable solution for a lot of people who are, who don't have, who can't afford these, uh, you know, human beings. Uh, yeah. Let's come back to Modern Speak. You're working across tech travel and lifestyle brands, I guess, as well. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for you coming in the influencer marketing space in the next few years? So for us, because we work on both sides, we're in this unique position of understanding how to manage a campaign, but also how to manage creators. So I think that duality puts us in a really unique position for working with brands because we understand the brand side, we understand the creator side. So our our brains are working in both ways. And I think that helps us understand the nuances of 
of everything. So we can really be strategic and we can be really smart in the way that we're talking to both sides. I mentioned it earlier. I think this win-win solution between pairing ethos-minded brands with destinations so that they can share costs and share opportunities is going to be, you know, a really big thing for us moving into 2025. But the biggest thing that I really want to see happen is more brands engaging with creators in long-term partnerships. So many brands will do one-off campaigns and then they'll see that that campaign didn't perform well. And they'll be like, okay, we're not working with that creator again. And, and I do get it. But at the same time, I know for me as a consumer, I don't buy something on Instagram unless I see a creator talk about it a handful of times. If I see someone talk about something once and then never again, I don't have that trust that they actually liked it or that they are continuously using it or that there is something that they're you know, advocating for or standing behind. So I think for brands to see a campaign not do well with a creator one time and then totally throw in the towel, I think is a really missed opportunity to nurture that relationship with their audience and build that trust over a longer period of time so that that creator can show how they're using that product in multiple different ways in their life rather than just the one time. And with algorithms now, we can't predict, you know, what they're going to do one day to the other. So just because a campaign flopped on one day, we have no idea why that is. It, it, It might not necessarily be because that product isn't interesting to that audience. It could be because of the news cycle. It could be because of an algorithm change that day. It could be for any number of reasons. And we'll have no way of knowing unless we continue to kind of test for a little bit longer period of time. And so I think now that we're living in this world of, you know, a a very oversaturated influencer market, finding those ambassadors for your brand and, and trying them out for a longer period of time is going to be so much more important for authenticity purposes than the one and done that, you know, seems to be happening right now. Wonderful. And for someone who's just starting in this space, what's the one piece of advice you'd like to share? So I love the saying, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. I think that individuality and like niche and carving out your own space on the internet is so important. As I said before, there's just, there's a lot of creators now and being able to have your own, like just your own thing going on. Cause there's a lot of copycat creators out there and there's a lot of creators who aren't necessarily producing anything that's original or authentic. And I think those types of creators, they might end up getting a bit lost in in the space because they might not know truly what their personal brand is. And it's hard when you're mirroring somebody else to have an authentic brand. So I would say like, you know, brands are looking for those compelling stories, those relatable, authentic stories. So it's only possible to achieve those things when you are understanding who you are as a person. So finding your alignment, finding your community, finding people who will support you. I think there's a lot of, you know, conversations around mental health in the creator economy right now that are so important and they have to be having. But creators need to understand going into this industry that having that community and that support system from family and friends and others in the industry is going to be so important and taking, you know, having good boundaries and taking time off from screens. I saw a thing recently that said like, post it and ghost it. Like sometimes you just have to post and then just like not sit there and watch every single comment and every single thing that comes in because you can't control it once it's out there into the world. And all you can do is put your art out there and hope that people will love it. And we're not going to win every single time, but we can't let that, you know, the times that we don't define who we are and take us down that, that path of being like, I'm not good enough. Why did I post that? Like, there's just so much of that that's happening. And I think, you know, having, you know, just being mindful of all of that is so important going into this. And I'm excited to see that we're in a place where there's like an influencer for everything now. Like you think of anything on this planet and someone's, you know, an expert on it, whether it's like a software, like I think about like, who are the, who are the philo influencers going to be? Cause they will be out there. There'll be people who get so passionate about a brand and a product that they, they birth this whole new like niche of creator because they've got like such a passion and an understanding of that product. And yeah, it's just, it's such a fun industry to work in because every single day is different. Yeah. And I come across, I come across such varied content on TikTok. I mean, it's amazing. You're right. Everything has a creator now, even, you know, somebody Mm -hmm. who's rolling down, you know, you know, bottles filled with colored, you know, water down the stairs. That's, that's another category. So, I mean, so much content and so much creativity. Thank God for that. Last a couple of rituals we make our guests go through. You have to give us a book recommendation and you have to tell us if you can share your Spotify list, uh, you know, playlist with us. (laughs) We'll definitely (laughs) put it in the links. I'm kidding. You can Uh, give us the book link. 
Okay, Spotify, Spotify playlists. Yeah, I mean, I've got hundreds of them. Uh, I listen to a, I listen to a lot of um, like folk, sad sort of music. So I don't know if anyone's going to want them unless they they need a good cry. But um, I, I'll, I'll flip you a few. In terms of podcasts, the one that I really love is Diary of a CEO. He's based out of the UK, Stephen, yeah. and he talks to just really interesting people, whether it's psychologists or politicians or other former CEOs. And I just find that he asks really hard questions. And those those podcasts are some some of them are over an hour. And I just find myself getting so involved in them. I'm I should be listening to a lot more business related (laughs) podcasts, like tech startup podcasts and things like that. But that's where I would be looking for other people to provide those recommendations. Right. And then in terms of books, I am probably not the best for these questions because I find, (laughs) I find for myself, honestly, for myself, after a day of like reading emails and reading newsletters and seeing what's on LinkedIn and, and all of that, I consider that my business reading for the day. And then when I come home, if I'm going to read anything, it's going to be like nonfiction beach read that like, I can just completely tune everything out and just like do it for entertainment purposes. Cause I feel like so much of my day is reading and so much of my day is listening that I just find that music and books can be an escape. And so I definitely, yeah. And that definitely last question. Would you like to nominate anyone for our show? like to nominate anyone for your show. Yes, I would love to nominate someone for your show. I would like to nominate Kaylee Gallagher. Okay. Yes, she is a fellow agency owner as well. And she works with impact influencers. So her roster is a lot of folks who are passionate about causes and taking influence to what I believe to be the best place in that it's people advocating for good causes and good, you know, social good. It's all about how do we do things in a way that's helping the world that we live in, whether it's environmental or, you know, women in business, all of those things that need to be part of a conversation and her creators are doing that. And I think that that is such an important place. Wonderful. Kristen Snell, thank you so much for coming to the show and bringing all the more clarity to this, you know, increasingly cluttered space of influencer marketing. You are doing wonderful stuff at Modern Speak. You are making lives easier through Digitoat. And yeah, I mean, you're passionate about people. You're passionate about communication. That's what, you know, gives us hope, you know, for the for the better future. So thanks again for coming to the show. Any last words would you like to share with our audience? I just want to say thank you again for, for having me and for anyone watching that's interested in what we're doing. You can find me on LinkedIn at Kristen Snell and Modern Speak on Instagram and Digitote on Instagram as well. And more exciting things to come in November in terms of Digitote will be launching in November. So keep an eye out for that. And thank you again. We'll put all these links in the description of the video. And thank you each and every one of you for, you know, Uh, getting us past 70,000 subscribers on YouTube means a lot. And uh, each episode is, you know, being watched more and more, which which gives us really, you know, uh, all the more excitement to, you know, do this and uh, and bring wonderful guests like Kristen. So thank you everyone for watching this. Uh, We'll see you in the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you. Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by Philo. Philo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms. To know more about Philo, visit getphilo.com. That's get, P-H-Y-L-L-O.com. Also, make sure to search for Influencer Marketing Podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast listening platforms. And don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Philo, thank you so much for listening.